Everybody, we are back. It is Scott and Edie here at our secret location at Ed Video at 404 York Road, Guelph, <laughs> Ontario, Canada. Uh, this is our fifth show. Yeah. And uh, how, how's it? How? What have you thought about our first week so far, Edie, doing um, this new show? It's been a bit confusing. Yes. A bit not confusing. Mm hmm. Not yoga. <laughs> Did you like that uh, little yes. intro I made late last night from a Vimeo template? Yeah, it was funny. Maybe we can make new uh, funny uh, intro videos. Yeah. Maybe this weekend, maybe you can make some animations. Okay. And then we can have different uh, intros and exits uh, graphics every day. Yeah. Yeah, because we looked at some of your After Effects work on uh, Monday because you were the very first guest. You're the co-host, the Go producer, and you were our first guest. So that was really fun. Um, yeah, and uh, so today we have an amazing guest. So I'll just very briefly introduce him uh, right now, but I'll save the details for later. He's waiting patiently on Skype. Uh, um, there he is, and we have a, ti we have a, a title card for him. Uh, let's take a look. There he is. Look at, I used the font that he likes. His name is Louis Javier Rodriguez, joining us all the way from uh, Cordoba, Mexico. We're going to talk about uh, some of his projects there and art things he's done in his community and things he's got on the go right now and take a look at some videos. He's a friend of mine that I've worked with before. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to cut that detail short because we're going to save it for when we really introduce <laughs> him. Um, but first, we're going to talk about uh, some uh, upcoming uh, guests that we have. Uh, let's take a look. So we 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 uh, don't do shows on weekends, especially on Easter weekend, but that's okay. Um, but we'll be back on Monday. It's every weekday at what time? Two p.m. At two p.m. every Monday. Sometimes we might have short shows for twenty minutes. Sometimes we might go for two hours. Uh, and the idea is uh, basically every day we have a guest on to talk about what they're up to. Usually an artist or an other interesting person. And we've had some great guests so far this week. Um, let's take a look at our upcoming schedule. Uh, where is it? Okay, so this Monday we have Sharmish Dakar, who's an amazing embroidery artist, sculpture artist, installation, uh, drawing and painting. She's from India, now she lives in London, Ontario. And she's been doing some live streaming too for the London Arts Council, showing some of her techniques, uh, some really great stuff from Sharmish Dakar. Looking forward to talking to her, she's a very cool person. Tuesday, we have something really special. We gotta get some guests for, for this, what is it? It's the Pet Show and Tell Day. So what happens that day? So there's people who do art. It can be any type of art. You don't need to be a professional artist. You can just be like... What do they some, need to have, But though? they need to have a pet. That they can show us on camera? Yes. And be ready to talk about their pet? Because we're going to yes. ask a lot of questions. Yeah. So we're hoping some people can Skype in for Pet Show and Tell Day, do something a little different. Maybe once a week we'll do some kind of like a fun style show. The next day after that is Wednesday, April 15th. That is special birthday show with... My mom, Jenny Norton. With Jenny Norton, media artist, show some of her work. And we'll just have some fun, we'll have yeah. some cake or <laughs> something, maybe some balloons, do something fun. Uh, and then Thursday, Jose Andreas Mora, who's incredible 
video installation artist. You won't believe some of the videos will show doc of documentation of his work. Uh, Ivana Dizdar is on Friday, April 17th. Joining us, she also has some incredible videos she's made. Really funny, really engaging. Looking forward to talking to Ivana. Then Monday, April 20th, we just confirmed this morning, our guest, who will be... Um, wait, where? Ivana... Oh. Oh, oh, that one. Tasman Richardson. Yeah, Tasman Richardson, dear friend of ours. Um, one of, I think, one of Canada's very best media artists. Uh, um, really excited. Uh, Tasman always has incredible things to say about, uh, about what he does and I just really want to talk to him and get a little geeky about what video is to Tasman because he's got some great ways of thinking about the medium. And then our last confirmed guest that we know of right now is Thursday, Tuesday, April 21st and that is... The Great Orbax. The Great Orbax. Hero to children everywhere. <laughs> science educator, sideshow performer, physics professor, Guinness Book of World Record uh, holder, um, monster of schlock, uh, incredible person. Can't wait to talk to him about all sorts of things. I imagine we might even go a little longer on a show like that when we have someone as great as Orbax to talk to. But now, <clears throat> Let's get into it today. We've got, just before we get going, we have a kind of a new setup here. Every day, our goal is to improve it a little bit. We showed you yesterday when we talked to Elia, kind of our setup, how we're running the show here live. Um, today, I've brought in another computer, an older computer. And uh, um, uh, so we have, like, I'm trying to make it a little slick, more slick each day. And, uh, and uh, we've got some some stuff prepared for our guest today, who is Louis Javier Rodriguez. There he is there. He's got his cat in this picture I stole from his Instagram. Maybe Louis could come back on Tuesday for um, Pet Show and Tell Day, maybe. Who knows? Uh, so let's take a look. Let's see if we can find Louis. Let's see. I think that's him. Are you there, Louis? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. How are you? Very good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, over in, in your show with, with you and Edie. And uh, just hoping to, to share some of the uh, very exciting things that I think uh, we've been doing over. Uh, and, and, the, and how it relates, I think, to, to the things that we're going to be doing in the future, all of us as, as a global society. Absolutely. That's exactly uh, why I was so, so excited uh, when you were willing to be a guest on our show because you've already been doing a lot of things that I think uh, um, are going to have become very important very quickly in the art, art with, in the sphere of art and how it works with people, with communities, with projects. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk to you about some of those things in a bit. So, so tell, us, uh, tell us, where are you right now? Right now, I'm at Cordoba, Veracruz, which is a, a small city. Uh, it's about an hour and a half away from the Veracruz Harbor, which is the, one of the uh, two main cities at, in the state of Veracruz. Uh, and here we were quite uh, far away from uh, what is like the, the other Mexican world, which is the, the big cities, you know, there's there's like two Mexicos. We call it the the cities and provincia, which is uh, uh, like it would translate as province, but it's it's like let's say it's it's a different reality. We have a lot of things in common. Everyone that's in provincia, which is not one of the, the three main cities in Mexico, uh, Mexico City, Guadalajara, and uh, Monterrey. And uh, here's where we've been, uh, I've been working uh, for the last uh, seven years already. Wow, wow, okay. So I just showed a little, for our viewers' benefit, uh, I just showed a map of Mexico where you're at. Uh, you're, you know, you're maybe how many hours driving from Mexico City? About, I'm guessing four, maybe? It's five, five and a half. It's like five hours. A little less than five hours to the, to the border of where the city starts, and then like one more hour till you get wherever you want to go in Mexico City, which is huge. Okay, and so how many people about live uh, in your city, uh, Cordoba? Uh, let me Google that for you because <laughs> I have no idea. 
I'm, I'm guessing just from seeing it on the map, uh, maybe 100,000 people, but I have no idea. Let me, let's get the, the 140,000 people. Wow, so that's almost the same size as Guelph, uh, yeah. where we're from here uh, at that video. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, always in contemporary art, like that, you know, it's always about the big, big cities, right? Uh, you know, London, Paris, New York, Los Angeles, and most, and very recently, I think a place that has really challenged those places as a capital for art is Mexico City. Um, so you're, you know, you're, as we'd say, spitting distance away from uh, Mexico City. Um, so, but I mean, sometimes it's difficult to be a smaller community near a larger one because it's also very easy to ignore places like that too. Do you find it yeah. a dynamic like that at all? The concentration of every sort of capital is, is very visible and uh, it's even more extreme because like in, in Canada you have like, and, and especially like in the United States or in Europe, you have a lot of big cities in each country. There's uh, like, you know, we don't have the equivalent of like a Chicago and there's like Boston and Los Angeles and you can go like anywhere in the States or in, or over, there's like Montreal, you know, Victoria, Toronto, they're all really, really big cities. Here it's very visually, uh, you can see it in, on a map very visually, it's totally different. Even the other big cities, which are Guadalajara and Monterrey, are... Uh, get dwarfed by the size of Mexico City. They do have a lot of concentration of uh, cultural and capital, uh, uh, of cultural and social capital, but the, the amount of, the sheer amount of people, of space, it's, it's absolutely different. And uh, everything is, is uh, even as we've been like getting more and more into a an, an, um, digital dynamic where things are, we're having the chance to be able to like compete on a level field uh, uh, as much as the algorithms of the social networks and the uh, search engines allow we're we're on a much more level field but still the the dynamics since there's like it's not just like the economic capital but the symbolic capital and everything is centered there uh, things tend to gravitate and artists are still uh, pretty much having to go there physically in order, well, they, uh, up until this new set of circumstances, they had to uh, go there in order to make it big, in order to sell big, to in, even to interact with the international market. You have to have a, a, an agent over in, in another country uh, or in Mexico City in order to, to really earn big from your art. Right. Yes, I mean, common international story perhaps but uh, maybe later we can talk about how that that whole idea that systems maybe being uh, maybe being challenged a little bit uh, now I'd like to ask you a few questions about I, what I think is sort of like the main thing you've done in in your city um, can you I've got uh, some pictures of this beautiful building uh, that you used to work at called Centro Cultural Casa Baltazar and um, maybe could you tell us uh, just a little bit about uh, about like what what you did there, what that place was like, some uh, things like that. I was it's over uh, ever since its inception in 2015. I I was uh, involved in the in the conceptualization of the the space. Uh, there's one of the there's. Four or five big uh, businesses here in, in in the city that give life to the city. One is uh, the coffee business, the cane sugar business, and uh, uh, there's like an, an big, really big uh, cooking oil factory, and those are like the the three main businesses that that uh, give life to to the region. And so one of the coffee brands had a chance to. Uh, renovate one of their spaces, and, and uh, I was able to to be on the process and be involved in the process and to have a say. And uh, we thought that we could make it into an, an art center, something that could use uh, 
the networks that uh, we already had as them them as a company and uh, me from my previous artistic experience and uh, do something valuable for for the community and it was not the idea was not just to to affect the community but to affect the state and, and hopefully uh, given these new possibilities to to have a, an even broader effect which i think we we mostly managed and so the idea was that there's a lot of uh, cultural interest uh, because there's uh, people, life is a lot slower than in the big cities. I, I'm guessing that, that Guelph is, is a lot like that as well. Yes. Um, things are slower, so people have more time. Even like people in all uh, social classes have a lot more time than people in their same social class over at any of the big cities or even medium-sized cities like Puebla, which is nearby, or uh, Veracruz City. And uh, so, but the art that was available was very much from leftovers, mostly from, from other times when, when there was a lot more wealth in terms of, of culture and, and of money. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, so it was, every, oh, most of the art, the art places and institutions revolve around modern art. Uh, art made in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and those aesthetics, even like uh, artists that are still working and that are uh, still uh, defining the cultural scene, they start over from that time, they're still uh, really big, and they're also teaching young artists, the schools are... uh, Places, even like at Jalapa, which is the capital of the state, they still teach a lot of things that how you would have taught it in the 70s and the 60s. And uh, so we thought that we had the, the, the connections and we knew people and we knew that we were going to activate those networks and be able to, to uh, make something even more uh, contemporary in order to to bring ideas and bring techniques and ways of thinking about art that were not didn't really didn't have a st- didn't stand a chance either in other institutions private or in the public institutions so we um, decided that we were going to be the the dedicated uh, to contemporary art 100% and we had to find ways to connect with the people and uh, uh, show them what contemporary art, contemporary ideas had to contribute to, to their life, to their enjoyment. And that was the, the main challenge during, during this time. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's a little bit how a video functions as well, as far as it's you know, very democratic and accessible about who can uh, use this place and the spirit of what sort of like artist run centers were set up to be uh, 30, 40 years ago, at least in Canada, you know, and I think it's um, very easy uh, uh, a lot of the time for the like official um, art community to sort of like overlook that dynamic. Some things kind of get through the cracks and people kind of get out or, um, you know, get, get into that more established system. But I mean, when you're dealing with the community, I mean, maybe the, the kind of the whole purpose of it is very different where it's not really about like, you know, what can you get on a CV? How great are your exhibitions? You know, who's reviewing your show? Uh, how, how much can you sell? So, you know, it's a lot more about like just the whole experience of art. Um, you know, maybe essentially the way it was in ancient times where it's just like a thing that people do. I've always kind of wondered if that idea is a little easier for Mexican people to understand that because there's this amazing thousands of years of history of incredible craft and uh, types of art. And I think I have a feeling like um, it's always been like kind of part of like society a little bit more than, well, I mean, like in more like settler people like me in Canada, um, just part of their philosophy of living. And so it's easy I think to get people interested in and people kind of uh, are open to it more, whereas maybe in Canada, um, more people are a little suspicious of contemporary art because it 
they find it confusing or sort of snobby or um, difficult to to access. Um, so, I mean, what, what kind of, uh, I mean, in your way of defining success, what kind of successes do you, did you have um, working there, like with youth, with like pe people who are just wanting to try new things or learn things? Like what, what was like uh, your definition of success working that way? Well, here it's uh, a lot about, I thought about it in, in terms of, uh, target audience. I, I originally uh, uh, graduated, graduated from a marketing school in the 2002-2003, I think. Um, and uh, I've always thought about it in terms of, of market, even if in the end it's not about uh, profit, but always it's about the market. There's, there's like a visual market, there's a, a cultural market, there's like even like an as in some ways, even like a spiritual market, you know, there's there's always like supply and demand and there's different kind of people and you have to think about them and how they think, how you can reach to different audiences. And uh, that wasn't uh, very different from here. Here we have uh, like, I, I think like one of the great marketing uh, like uh, I, I don't want to call them gurus because they don't go out and teach, but they do share uh, the marketing avatars of, of the present is like Facebook, you know, and, and when you get a glimpse at how they think when they give conferences, so they're like giving a TED talk or something like that, you really find out a lot about the, the, the cutting edge of marketing. And when they talk about like, um, Cambridge Analytica, they talk about uh, one of the main ways to separate, pe to, to segment people, to segment the message, is to think about how uh, propense to either fear and how uh, attached to structures people are. Uh, we could call them like the, how conservative you are in different aspects of your life. Because that's like a very primary, and you you're driven to either uh, fight or flight, or or you feel that something connects with you in a way that that you wanna be there, enjoy it, and, and like you know uh, revel in it. So, and that's that's like something that makes it very clear. That's a very basic, very primal way of of segmenting people, and you can see it with the arts as well. There's always people that will have very strong defenses and they will feel like you are the enemy when you're trying to show something. It's not even about something new. Like if you're like uh, pro-impressionistic uh, painters and someone else is, is about expressionism, there's going to be like people that take it so seriously and they find it so challenging to, to take the point of view of the other seriously that you're going to have be... Uh, lines drawn you know so you have to find ways to interact with people on different levels of defensiveness it's it's sounds very awful but it's really effective once you put it in in, in place so you have to uh, uh, always connect with something that they know they appreciate and they they uh, think it's valuable and start from there with the different kinds of Public. So the younger crowd have different fears and they have different defenses than older people. And in older people, you have like the people that are more connected with tradition and the ones that are more forward looking and uh, people that even if uh, like in, in uh, numeric years, they, they uh, are older, they actually are very engaged with new technologies that accept a lot of different things, uh, are con constantly looking for new music and stuff like that. And those people are a lot easier to find and to connect. And they're, they're a very relatively small audience. And that's like your core audience. And you have to be faithful to them and appeal to them and give them what they want and have things that are cutting edge. But at the same time, you want to have things that connect with things that other people feel are special and valuable. And you have to mix them and, and, and in order to, and, and people that are really, really stubborn 
will appreciate what they appreciate. They're going to say, this thing you did was fine, but this other thing, that, that's too much. But they're still there. They're going to be engaged with you as an institution. And um, that's the, the, the strategy. And, and we usually had, uh, over at Casa say we had an exhibit that was very cutting edge, something very conceptual and hard. And then we had something that was connected to either illustration or even we could have like hybrid shows where we would try uh, you uh, do shows that were like very conceptually dense, but with artists that had a lot of uh, manual skills, you know, and that's something that people that are very traditional can connect to and not feel as threatened. They say like, yeah, this is something weird and I don't know what's going on here, but they really can draw. They really can uh, uh you know, uh, they really have like manual skills and, and that's something I can connect to. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, you're really summarizing a lot of the ideas that I think about too, as we're both curators. I think uh, sometimes the role of a curator is to sort of trick the audience in a way uh, to sort of, I think of it like a fishing hook, sort of like you put something really tasty, some bait on it and then like catch them and then pull them in to see something they normally wouldn't uh, they normally wouldn't experience, especially I find with uh, video art, with media art, you know, it can be very difficult to consume. It doesn't really fit very well sometimes into a white cube. Um, you know, it's hard to control the viewer's experience of it. And just inherently, it is very challenging it breaks all the rules of every type of video that people are normally used to seeing so i mean i i uh i'm really aware of that sometimes and sometimes i'll i'll curate shows with uh, i very rarely curate a show that's just video i almost even though we're a media art center and that's our mandate i try to mix in other types of art uh, along with it so anything more traditional or painting, printmaking, sculpture, uh, whatever, um, to try to get people who are more comfortable with those things to come in. And then by, by chance, there's some video playing there too. Um, so I'd like to actually watch a clip of a show that uh, uh, you and I, I guess, curated together about four years yeah. ago at uh, yeah. Casa Baltazar. I was very happy when you gave, uh, gave me this uh, invitation um, to curate the video component for this exhibition called uh, Triada. Am I saying that right? Triada? Yeah, Triada, yes. It's like, three, like a three-person thing, like a trio, right? No, it's like a, a musical term, which is the, the basic... It's, it's triad in, in English, which is a music term for the jazz uh, uh, timing. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, I didn't, I didn't really get it. I knew it meant three something or I don't know, but uh, I thought I did. But uh, um, let's take a look at this clip uh, that you uh, made. It's like a video walkthrough of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's I don't think there's any sound. So we'll just talk through it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I sent you some uh, four videos, I guess, from uh, mostly kind of local artists. Um, <clears throat> one of them is uh, Juliana Ferranda, one is Steph Yates, one mm -hmm. is an artist, Janet Morton, right? that's mm -hmm. her work right there, and that's, uh, that's uh, she li actually lives about one block away from here. And the last mm -hmm. one uh, I'm seeing a glimpse of right there is some video work by Ambra Wellman, who uh, yeah. isn't really known for her video work, but uh, uh, more for her painting, but this was actually the, the first time she had an exhibition in uh, in Mexico. Um, and then about a, two years later, I brought some of her paintings to the Material Art Fair in Mexico City, and it went really well. And then she's had many solo, a few solo shows since then. Now she actually lives in Mexico City. She's li living there for about uh, about two about two months uh, or three months from now. Um, so can you talk a little bit just about that exhibition and some of your ideas and how maybe how it worked with the jazz festival that was happening yeah. there? Yeah, the jazz festival is one of the uh, really most uh, exciting things that, that are having going on here. Like there, we have a couple of festivals which are really big. One is the theater festival. The other is the jazz festival and the traditional music uh, song festival, which is uh, they're all uh, 
funded differently and they've been funded different each year but every time there's you can see the work of people that are really uh, working and really dedicated to each of them and in a very serious way people that are traveling and and have, find, finding the way to operate uh, as exceptions to to the normal dynamics and um, uh, we were always very happy to work with the jazz festival because the it lends itself to very both the traditional audience and the modern and more contemporary inclined audience because there's uh, jazz is something that cuts through it, it feels something that feels uh, very high culture but at the same time it's very approachable it's something that uh, it's very young but at the same time has very old roots and there's really old people that are into jazz that have been into jazz since they were young and there's also young people that we have a lot of um, communication here with Jalapa which is the the capital of the state and where uh, most of the public universities are and um, there they have a really cool jazz program which is Jazzu. And the founder and director of the jazz festival is one of the kids that really got into music. He's actually the um, uh, grand nephew of one of the most legendary jazz uh, players, and uh, Juan Jose Calatayud. And, and uh, so he's uh, he had the connections to start with from from his great uncle, and then he's made his own. And uh, so we thought it was really strategic to, to be connected with the, the festival and have them in any way that we could. And one of the things that we could do is uh, curate uh, shows every year for the, for the festival. And that, I think that was actually the first year we, we put together something for them. And so the idea was that they were uh, works of art that mirrored the characteristics the conceptual characteristics of jazz music, which is improvisation, flow, uh, dynamic, rhythm, things like that. And um, um, we, we were very lucky in, in being able to, to collaborate with you and, and show side by side things that were really interesting made of, with, uh, uh, from uh, Mexican artists and uh, uh, these really interesting pieces that it really it really felt like a coherent show in the end, even if uh, we were working basically from from concept, you and I, we were not uh, like following each other's footsteps uh, like every day, but we had a very clear like outset uh, concept at the outset, and then in the end we did manage to get I think a very coherent show. Uh, which was also very uh, approachable. Both the uh, the video art and the plastics had things that were very young, very fresh, and at the same time we had things that uh, show a lot of craft. Uh, of craft. Uh, I think especially like Janet Morton was uh, really something really that people really connected with. The, they saw the the time and dedication that went into the piece and. Uh, that's something that people are always always appreciate. They feel like they have to stop. They think they feel, even if sometimes there's, when you're uh, you have a background in video art, you know that sometimes pieces that are made really fast uh, can be really interesting. Usually, people tend to stay and stick with things that have what we would call like production value, you know, and that um, uh, that piece in particular has a lot of production value. And uh, also we did this, uh, uh, we printed a, a photograph that was supposed to hang, we hanged it next to the work. And that made people stop and consider the, the time spent and the, the craft spent in doing it. And uh, that was something that was uh, mirrored through the show. And then we had like uh, Amber's work and uh, that was a lot more spontaneous and more like about uh, something that you can experience directly and you had like, uh, 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 you were hit by the work in, in real time. And uh, in the end you had things that bo were both engaging, immediately engaging, and things that you could 
keep thinking about and remembering after you went to, to through the show? <clears throat> well, I'm glad it did work. Uh, um, yeah, because like you say, we didn't plan everything perfectly and make sure all the colors match and everything is uh, going to be perfect. But it was funny that you asked me because that's, you know, the, the theme of that exhibition is a very big theme uh, in Guelph. Uh, we, we have a whole university department here at the University of Guelph. Um, and then kind of the entire philosophy is thinking about improvisation, uh, sort of how it originated in some ways in jazz music, but how can you improvise in your community, improvise like uh, with culture and art and people and projects and, um, you know, what lessons can be learned from that. Um, so, I mean, it's uh, being applied, that whole idea is being applied academically um, to, to think about uh, arts and culture in a different way. So it was, I think it, it just kind of uh, made sense somehow, like perhaps that you invited me in. I really want to thank you for that opportunity. I really always sort of regret I couldn't get there to see it in person, but I'm very thankful also you sent me the wonderful photos and whatnot. I'd like to talk now about kind of your uh, current project that you have going on. Um, you know, as I understand it, it's uh, um, uh, sort of a, right now at least, um, based on Latin American vi dance videos, um, kind of thinking about how dance videos just function for one, but also maybe how Latin American dance videos might be different than uh, other dance videos from other countries, but also how um, people, uh, dance dancers are depicted in video um, differently than they are in other ways on screens as more uh, like uh, real bodies, I suppose, <laughs> not always uh, <clears throat> glamorizing things. Um, but then the other part of it I'm very interested in is, uh, is uh, sort of how dance and video technology meet as well to sort of make something new entirely that's beyond both of those things. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And maybe as you are, I might, I might play one or two of the videos uh, just, sure. uh, just to, while, while you're speaking about it. Yes, uh, the, the project is called Carrion TV, which is actually a, a play with words that uh, recalls uh, one of the, for me, the, the greatest uh, uh, Mexican video artist, which is uh, uh, Ulises Carrion, who's actually from Veracruz. Uh, he's one of the subjects that have really captivated me uh, as in my uh, my time studying statics and Latin American statics, and he's uh, really not that well known outside of Mexico City, and he's a, a Mexican that that was originally uh, a writer, and once he reached began reaching some famous writer, he changed to conceptual art first through writing. He started making books uh, about books and and deconstructing language and the way that books work. And then he started making video art. Uh, he moved to Holland uh, in right when he was uh, becoming very famous. And uh, there he founded a cultural institution called Other Books and So. And he's all around a very, very interesting character and with very interesting art. He has a piece, a uh, very early piece, when he was... Uh, carrying a TV that had uh, the recording of a show and he was moving as the camera would move in order to to show things in the physical space as they would be in the imaginary space of the, the screen. And uh, But he has a lot of work in radio as well. And um, that's the, the first reference, but as, it's also Carrion TV in, in the way that it's about Carrion in, in you know, the corpses that 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 uh, uh, prey animals that um, uh, feed on like uh, vultures and, and stuff like that because uh, in in Latin American theory uh, there's there's um, a, a very strong decolonial bent and there's uh, one of the, the theorists says that the history and the culture of the people that are colonized is based on the refuse of the main culture, and then of the yeah of the of the in, uh, the carry on the the things that are discarded, 
And I think the concept of carry on that way uh, is uh, about how interesting it is to live and to work and to feed from that, refuse from the things that are left over. And it's a bit dramatic, but I think it's very, uh, it's, it feels right for when talking about Latin American art because it gets lost. It, it goes down a, a hole and there's very few uh, repositories of Latin American video art and digital art in general, but especially video art because video art has been kind of left over by the sites, we're starting to live in, in an era where the cutting edge art, uh, technology wise, refers to like video games and uh, like uh, doing things with code and uh, being digital in, in other ways. And we seem to have skipped a whole uh, era of uh, digital uh, video making. And there's not a lot of repositories. There's not a lot of, not a lot of memory. And people, the people that started with it, are uh, a lot of them are dead. Rudy Scarron has been dead for for a good while. And the people that work alongside him uh, are people that started with uh, film, with uh, eight millimeter film, sixteen millimeter film, such as Paula Weiss. And uh, I was lucky enough to to take classes from uh, Sara Minter who was a, she had the Rockefeller grant at one point. She made a couple of really good uh, uh, home videos that were art pieces. And um, she also passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, that made me think that it shouldn't happen with, with uh, because there's a lot of really worthy art and a lot of it is being shown internationally. And while other countries in other places have ways to record that, to keep that going on and to reactivate those works. In Mexico and Latin America, we, we have very little in the ways of that. We have uh, the, a lot of the works like from Ulises Carrion are actually in the uh, their property of Philips in, over in, in, in Holland. And uh, the same thing happens with, with a lot of uh, really big artists when they go big enough, they start selling on the international art market. And while like local companies might buy uh, big paintings and still and collage and stuff like that, they will rarely buy something that is not tangible. They, it never really catch in, in, in society to buy digital, digital works. So there's very little memory. A lot of the works are with the artists or with international institutions. And that's, that's why I want to make um, a series of uh, shows uh, slash, uh, it, it can't be really a show because of course the way uh, you become an, an spectator, you are an spectator for video art in your home, in, in a device is very different than in, in a physical space. And even if you're right, it's very strange to, to like walk and go, like I've been to a shows in, in, in international uh, museums in Mexico City or, or in other countries and you have the where you go and see it and, and watch some video art the best I've seen is these like arcades that are closed where you see it and, and you watch the screen uh, big screen and uh, that's like the closest the, the most familiar way because you can be seated the the length of the videos are always uh, a challenge to to the natural flow of a gallery. There's also the thing with sound, you have to have like headphones, especially if you have multiple works. And, uh, but at the same time, when you're in your house, you tend to like, uh, you start seeing it and you get distracted and someone else is doing something else next to you. So it's things that we have to work out because there's really, really valuable works and really interesting artists that, uh, would be very difficult to get into uh, unless we find a way. So the way that I'm structuring it, it's like a uh, halfway magazine and halfway um, gallery, uh, virtual gallery. But I think that we it's going to be uh, um, a while until we all collectively find a way to, to really engage with those kind of works. Uh, but we have to find it because there's there's a lot of really valuable stuff and there's a period of, of contemporary art that's going to get lost if we don't find the way 
you know there's going to be a hole yes yes i i i agree um so this format though is like you started thinking about this before the international pandemic uh, about uh, how to, new ways to show video and talk about ideas like half as you say halfway like you know sort of like a magazine sort of online you know um um is this a format that suddenly kind of just started making a lot more sense to you a few weeks uh, ago yeah yeah i felt the pressure i because like a lot of people say that this is like one uh the first big uh call to attention that we get globally but it's gonna not going to be the last uh, as much as this seems to be extending uh, itself uh, to the future as this seems it's going to take a lot longer than a lot of people or originally thought at the same time it's like one thing from many really big global problems uh, as we evolve into a more global society we start uh, having a lot more global problems and that this is like the very first one when, when I was talking with, with someone and we said that this is effectively the end of a world. It may not be the end of the world, but it's, it's the end of a world, definitely. And that we felt physically the, the, the globaliz globalization, we, we feel it like we're really feeling it. Even people that haven't been able to stop and, and people from really uh, difficult positions that they still have to go out and work, they, they're feeling it. You feel it on the street. And so um, we have to find ways to, to live through this and whatever comes next. And uh, luckily enough, and we have these new technologies. This would be like very different if we had, didn't have these, these technologies. And uh, it's going to be born out of necessity, but we do have to think about it really hard so it doesn't... It is not defined by big corporations and by governments. We have to find ways that we use it and we can uh, adapt to it in ways that at least from hindsight seem more beneficial to us as individuals because we're going to be uh, offered options definitely, but the options are mostly going to be from people that have the money to withstand this and at the same time develop things and both technological and social and ways to connect that are convenient for for certain people and us as individuals should find ways that are good for us and, and develop those ways because otherwise we it's going to become what the, some of the skeptics and the beginning thought which is this is just a way of social control and we're going to make it true if we don't act and we don't think about it and work in it and fail and succeed, you know. We have to try and we have to, like, venture and, and, and risk uh, our, our resources or time or um, reputations in order to find things. We have to, to be bold in that way. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I agree. So what what do you think? Uh, what are, what are you thinking about? What are you what are you gonna try next? I mean, are you gonna use this format for uh, other themes? Are you gonna try to do maybe some more things online this way, or combine online art with writing? Or what what are you thinking about these days? Even though we're just like kind of a few weeks or a month sort of into this new reality, um, where are your thoughts at, Louis? I think that fortunately we have a lot of theory over from people that were very interested in digital culture already, and it's a lot. A lot of it is coming from places where they have like labs and th th things like that. Um, I re I'm really interested in um, some. Uh, there's a French book, uh, Cinema dans la tête, uh, that it's very interesting. There's also some Swedish and some Danish theories that have been doing some experiments and things about a spectatorship and I think we can take cues from them in order to try and develop something that is well thought, that is round and that we can uh, use to, to improve our engagement with, with 
art uh, because we're all or already involved in, in improving our communication with each other and I think like this this show is a great example I think you're getting the hang of it real fast I saw the first show I saw the second show the third show and this one and I think this is like growing really fast and uh, we have to uh, some of us have to do the same thing with uh, with art I think there's there there do is pressure and uh, we do have to come up with something uh, and something that is really well well thought. And I, I think that that's, that's the next thing to think really hard and to while we're experimenting to really do each iteration of whatever we're doing uh, the best we can and research and not just try and do it because I've seen, um, of course we have to try and, and I'm saying that we have to fail, but I've seen some like really big museums and really big institutions do things that feel really incomplete. That there's you can see there's not a lot of thought behind it, and that is uh, it, it. It begins to become like some sort of white noise, you know. And uh, we have to avoid that. We have to avoid the point where we're already like you're already uh, competing with everyone. You're not just competing with with you know the MoMA and. The, uh, the Louvre and the um, Netflix and uh, everyone giving out their their work uh, online movies and short films and uh, so we have to find ways to organize that to create um, I think that's the thing I think curators also as curators have that task I don't want to say it's like more important than all other tasks because we're obviously like uh, uh, secular concern for the rest of the world, but we see it very up close, and, and, and I feel that urgency very up close because we're on that thing, and we have to find a way to create the experiences. At the end of the day, that's our job, that's the artist's job, and that's the curator's job to create experiences. We have to create experiences that are meaningful, and uh, so that we can engage with everything that's going on, with everything the the big institutions and the small institutions and the artists are doing, we have to mediate those experiences so that they become uh, enjoyable for people. I think that that's, that's the main concern right now, and I'm struggling, me personally, in this project that I had already started, but it's taking new uh, importance and uh, uh, I think um, um, that that's my concern. I, how to do it more enjoyable? How to turn it into an experience and not just like show the the videos and just go at it, but have some kind of a help define an experience. And that that's that's the next thing for me. Well, I think uh, that that's a good approach. I think. I mean, it's still super early to figure it out, but those. Uh, I think that's a good way to think of it. Is you know, there's there's something to be said for just doing things and trying things, but uh, I think it's also my concern too. Is like, well, what's what's still good though? Like, what what makes sense right now to do um, with the technology that we have? Um, I mean, I've always, since I was a young person, thought about the idea of creativity is just working with what you've got to make something amazing mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people are really uh, like you say large organizations the thing they've always had is their giant galleries and uh their prestige and when mm -hmm. that is like a hundred percent taken away um i think they're really struggling to figure out uh how they can still be a value to people without their bricks and mortar uh space and so they're trying all sorts of things but uh, a lot of it is just, um, it doesn't translate into uh, new mediums very well. And there's always like this idea to try to just like force things to be online that don't make sense instead of honoring what sort of makes sense uh, online. For example, at Art Basel, that was scheduled to happen uh, right before this pandemic happened. They very quickly, and they did a great job of it, made these sort of virtual galleries for each booth. Um, mm -hmm. And you can log in and look at like these top commercial galleries from around the world and see this little like white cube thing. But it, the absurdity of it suddenly was, it was wild to look at like, you know, here's a 
you know, some art piece, uh, you're seeing it on your screen, is $800,000, like in a fake gallery. And it's just like, wow, like it seems like not just like from yesterday's world, but it seems like like you can't almost can't help but laugh at it now. Uh, yeah. You know, and a lot of places are trying trying anything they can figure out, which is great, and and people will. But uh, but I mean, I'm very cautious. Like you know, maybe maybe this doesn't ha like doing this show doesn't have like immense value. Like we're having ten thousand people a day, but a lot of it, I'm like, well, uh, the part besides live streaming it which is sort of just a practical way because uh, if I started editing all this, it would take me forever. Uh, it keeps mm -hmm. a little of ex excitement going on with everything, with Edie and I here. Um, but it's just like recording a lot of things I think is important. And a lot, I'm realizing like this, doing this style of web show can be like a vessel for a lot of ideas I've had for years. Like I'm like, oh, actually the best format for it is uh, like a vessel. Like, for example, I've always wanted to collect stories about the early days of Ed Video from the 1970s, because some of those founders are very old now, and we've never really recorded it. And I'm like, oh, all I have to do is some web shows now, and all these stories will be recorded forever um, in video. And otherwise, I'd probably overthink that idea in the past and try to make a book that takes a year and no one wants to read it or something like that. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's uh, it's kind of exciting and it's kind of uh, I, I kind of wonder if people have, like you and I have sort of, you know, I've we've both had our fingers in both pies, like where it's like. <laughs> you know, kind of the official contemporary art side and this community thing at the same time, trying to mix them together. But those who have never really worked sort of in the grassroots side, um, mm -hmm. I think they're struggling, whereas you and I, like maybe we're, we've already been doing things sort of one-on-one -on -one with people, helping people actually make things, helping them try to find their voice. Um, so maybe, uh, Maybe in the end, maybe we have a, a slight advantage because of these uh, these experiences. Yeah, and, and I think that we can take cues from things that were already working in these formats because there has been a lot of uh, really digital culture, uh, really big um, events happening in, in, in the last year. And I think that there's people that are, are doing it very well in other areas. And I think we need to take cues from that. There's like a really huge podcast scene in the, in the English world. And there's like uh, from both independent people and from the institutions, like the New Yorker has some really amazing podcasts. And uh, there's like things like Radiotopia and they have like 99PI and Criminal and things like that. And uh, there's like democracy now, you know, there's think people that have been doing it really well. And I think that some of the cues that like just think it out loud right now, uh, we can see in things that have been successful, successful right now, which is things like like this when we're converse, having a conversation and going deep into things like um, and having passion, I think that's one great key for it. And then we can see uh, things that are in, in the written sense, like the New York, New York Times have, has been like uh, becoming more and more of a digital medium. Uh, and they have this really cool like uh, multimedia stories where you're like scrolling and there's like some, a video and there, there's an animation and a graph and there's text. And uh, things like that, I think we can take t take cues from that uh, because they 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 work. People, there's a really big digital audience, and the people are becoming uh, more and more that digital audience. And we're uh, lucky to have those those like people that are already plowed the way in front of us. And even just like having the format of this show is is of course trailing on the steps of of other people that have been doing it really good for some time and then there comes like our innovation and, and the way we translate what, what we usually do into these formats and that's going to be the this is like a, a great starting point and we have to be like aware and, and like awake and seeing things and we have to keep uh, watching whatever we hear about and, and I've seen like some of this uh, Instagram transmission, live transmissions when you invite people and 
and things like that, and finding out which are the ones that really you can connect with and see what they're doing right. And it's it's like uh, learning one more way, the same way that when we started doing shows, we had to learn about the study, of course, uh, if we had the chance, or just get into uh, museography and uh, and um, advertising and all these tools that we use for work. Now we have to like add one more piece, which is at the same time very complex. And, and we, there's people that have been studying this for a long time and we have to catch up really fast. But I think that uh, there there are keys and there are cues and, and there there's uh, our communities, you know, there's like 4chan, you know, if we could be like <laughs> used that Reddit, you know, if we could find a way to engage in that deep, deep way and, and, and with uh, the things that uh, we think are important, then we would be like uh, on the other side of, 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 of uh, the future, you know. I, I like to think so. And I like to think that a lot of the uh, apocalyptic films are wrong where uh, society, I'm hoping, is not going to fall into chaos. It uh, might, in most cases, I hope, of course, it won't be every every time, but hopefully it brings people together more and reassesses people's values, what they love, who they love, what's, you know, what's important to them around, around them. Um, and maybe it's like a big deep breath for for people um at first i didn't really think uh, it was important to do a show like this i thought you know right now the important people in society are the people who are still risking their health each day out there doctors nurses uh, even people working at grocery stores people are um you know trying to keep society going as like right now is not the time for contemporary artists but uh, you know, about a week ago, I was like, you know what, actually, I think everyone can do what they can do. And there is a there is an important role um, that artists uh, and curators and, uh, can play in it because um, uh, that's what they know to do. And if that gives people comfort in some way, that's that's important, too. And it's better than not doing anything, which I think there's a kind of a trick right now with people um, thinking that's the best thing to do is like if you're at yeah. home, all you can do is do nothing, sit and watch Netflix. And I'm like, well, that's, I'm, I'm very cautious of that idea. I, I know a lot, of, I know people have a lot to process and it's only four or five weeks thinking about this and it's very traumatic, but also, uh, you know, if this goes on for a long time, um, that, that attitude is not going to really work for, for people for many reasons, for just the way they feel about themselves, for their mental health, for how they feel that they're part of society. So, I mean, any positive action I think is good right now, even if it's not perfect. And it's, it's also fine if people haven't gotten there yet but i mean if we're in this for a year like uh, people are gonna have to reassess what their abilities are um what they can offer uh, all sorts of things like this um so uh, i think we're i think we're gonna leave it there but i, I really wish you success with your your projects sure. uh, it was really nice to talk to you today i've always i've met you in real life a few times but it's always at frantic art fairs and there's a lot of mm -hmm. noise and distraction and uh, not not and not for too long. So it's a really it's really good to catch up with you to know that you're doing safe, doing well, being safe, and uh, still still thinking about what you can do uh, with your talents. Um, do you have anything you want to finish up by saying? Anything for about uh, any messages or ideas that you have, Louis? Well, I'm, first, uh, thank you again for 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 inviting me on, and and I'm really exciting to see what this evolves into i want to see like all of your shows and uh, stay connected and uh, i'll let you know when uh, i get more things that are like you sh user ready so that you can help me share them i would love to i would love to if you have uh, if, um, more things that we can stream or share like that'd be fantastic we need we're doing this every weekday for at least for a few weeks maybe yeah. for a few months i don't know yeah. uh maybe even we're thinking if when the pandemic's over maybe this just may, is a better format than what we were doing before who knows uh, at least you should keep doing it like, at least once a week even if, if this uh ends we you should keep doing it because there's uh inherent value for people elsewhere I, I, I mean I love following a video from the distance since I see the pictures of the show but uh, it's always 
uh, it it has a lot more depth uh, for me to watch these shows than than watching the the pictures of the of the openings and stuff like that. I I appreciate that, and uh, you know uh, it's been great great to work with you in the past, and uh, I'm really looking forward to someday, who knows when, when I can see you again in real life. Uh, yes. Either in Mexico or in Canada or somewhere else, and we'll see how that works. But in for the time being, we'll check in on each other on the internet, okay? For sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much if you're Thank watching. You. Uh, uh, this is what I think we're going to call this show is uh, Open Circuit. You think so? Yeah. We've gone through a few different names here, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll settle with that for now. Maybe we'll just change the name. Who cares? We can do whatever we want here, can't we? Are you having fun? Yeah. Yeah? And uh, you're going to make a dance video, aren't you? <laughs> I think you have to for your dance class. Yeah. Yeah? Um, well, maybe maybe if you make an awesome one, maybe you'd be inspired by some of the ones we saw today. Uh, maybe we'll play it on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah? All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Hope you're enjoying the show. Happy Easter. If you're into Easter, it's Easter. Didn't really think about that. I kind of forgot what holidays are all about. Uh, didn't really seem to uh, to matter too much to me that it's a holiday because we're kind of on our flexible schedule right now. Um, thank you so much to Louis for joining us today. You can tune in on um, on Monday at 2 p.m. We have an amazing artist, uh, Sharmish Takar, joining us. And uh, we're going to talk about some of her projects and her artwork. Maybe sh show uh, some of her live stream videos um, that she's doing right now. Um, yeah, are you ready to play a Zed Yeah. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 